Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about one of my favorite resources on Ancestry.com and that is the Ancestry card catalog. Now, if you're not familiar with the card catalog or you've never used it before, that's fine. That's what we're gonna do today is just walk through how to use it. If you are familiar with the card catalog, I bet that you are gonna learn something new today. Um, just a few, I'll share with you a few of my favorite tips and tricks for using it. Um, and uh, stay tuned to the end. I am gonna share with you a little hint or a little, um, in technology, it's called a hack, um, that will help you to maybe discover even more about about your family history. Uh, let's talk just briefly before we dive into the presentation about um, why the card catalog is important. There are two questions that I get probably more than just about any other question. The first one has to do with um, what records Ancestry.com has. So people who are thinking about upgrading from a US subscription to a world subscription, or people who are trying to find family in other countries, very often I'll get emails that say, "Do you have? does Ancestry.com have records for Poland? Does Ancestry.com have records for um, you know, whatever country or location or time period? And the card catalog answers every one of those questions. And so if you learn how to use it, you'll be able to answer that question for yourself. The other question that I get a lot has to do with searching. Uh, when you are searching on Ancestry.com, when you just fill in just the general search form, you are searching all 12 billion records on our website. Um, that's why we call it a global search. You plug in some information and we're searching all 12 billion records. And then we serve up to you whatever search results fit any of the criteria that you searched on. And so sometimes that's a little overwhelming. One of the purposes of the card catalog is to help you see database specific collections so that you can search just one of them. So I'll show you a couple of ways that I do that. Um, and like I said, we'll talk some basic stuff, we'll get into some more advanced stuff, and then I'll share a favorite hint at the end of our time together today. So let's go ahead and dive into what I've prepared here. Um, we're gonna talk about using the card catalog. For those of you who've never used the card catalog before, here is where you are going to find it. When you're on Ancestry.com, if you just hover over the search button, remember hover, just move your mouse over it, don't click on anything yet, you'll see a drop down list appear and the card catalog is the very bottom item on that drop down list. Once you see it appear, then you can go ahead and click on card catalog and that will take you to the card catalog. Now, um, I've got it up, oh, I've got it up on my screen here, so let me just pull that up. Here is the card catalog, this is what that page looks like. Let me make it bigger so you can see it, okay? Um, Ancestry.com currently has 31,389 databases on our website. So that, so we have 12 billion records. Those records are each contained in an individual database. When I say database, I just mean a collection of records. So for example, the 1900 US Federal Census is a single database. That single database, if you look over here, has 77,277,539 records in that one database, okay? So 31,389 databases online on Ancestry.com. And so what the card catalog does is it doesn't show you people. You're not searching people. You're searching to see what kinds of records exist. Now the default sort on this list is always popularity. So whenever you come to the card catalog, they're going to be sorted in order of popularity based on um, how many searches are done in each database specifically and how many records people are looking at from each database. So this changes a little bit sometimes, but not much because usually our member trees, the most recent censuses, our city directory collection, which I love, it has 1.3 billion records just in that one database. Um, 19, 1900 census, you just kind of work your way down the list, right? So these are our most popular databases. We sort it that way because we assume most people, and, and we assume it based on data, we assume that most people are going to be looking for one of those specific databases, okay? You can change the sort of those databases. Right up here in the center where it says sort by, you can sort it by database title. That puts the list in alphabetical order. 
Now, when you're looking at all 31,000, that's not that important, but you'll see here in just a minute why that might be. You can also sort it by date updated or date added. And what it does is it puts the most recently added collections at the top of the list. So here we can see this collection of um, Romania Jews from Iasi who served the survived the transports in 1941 was just added to our database. You'll see when I hover over any one of those, this database was just added to Ancestry.com on the 8th. Um, so if I hover over, there's a little pop-up card. It tells me the date that that database was published. And so you can see the 8th, so two days ago, it looks like a few of these databases were added to the website, or in this case, um, published or updated. Okay, so that, you can sort that way, so you can see the new stuff at the top of the list. And then you can also sort by record count, which is for some people just um, kind of a, an interesting thing. It's I use it very rarely in that feature, but basically what it does is it puts the largest databases at the top of the list. So you can sort however you'd like, but just remember that the default sort every time you come into the card catalog is going to be by popularity, okay? Now, let's just talk a little bit about how you can use the card catalog. First of all, you have the ability to search the card catalog by title or keyword. Here's how I use that most often. If I know, for example, um, my screen's big and so it keeps jumping. Let me shrink it just a little bit. There we go. Um, if I know, for example, that I am looking specifically for um, uh, the 1910 census, I can just type 1910 in the title field and now that census is the top thing on my list. I can click on it, go straight to that database and search just the 1910 census, okay? Um, if that's how I use that title field. If you don't know how Ancestry.com has titled a specific database, if you're just exploring to see what's available, you're probably not going to want to use that field. I use that field, like I said, if I know what I'm looking for and I, I wanna just pull it up right away, okay? So that's how I use that field. The keyword field can be used in a few different ways. Um, if you want to find all records, for example, for Native Americans, I can type the word native in the keyword field and it will come up with all sorts of things, right? 94 databases. Basically what that means is the word native appears somewhere in either the title of the database, like it does here for these Native American enrollment cards, or it appears somewhere in the database description. So this is the US Indian Census rolls, but if I were to open up that database and scroll down, I'm gonna bet that the word native or Native American appears somewhere in the database description under the search box, okay? So that is, the keyword field is one way in which you can explore what is out there. Um, another thing I'll often do is type the word free in that, data, in that database description, keyword, or in that keyword field, because if a database is free on Ancestry.com, we are going to include that usually in that database description. And so it's a quick way to find what databases are free on Ancestry.com. Uh, so the, these are the databases for which you do not need a subscription or you do not need a world subscription in order to access them and use them, okay? So um, play around with those title and keyword fields just to see what kinds of things come up based on different keywords that you might be searching for, okay? Now, the more powerful things on the card catalog is the filter. This is where you're going to answer the question, does Ancestry.com have records for X country state time period, right? So there are three main ways to filter this database, um, this card catalog of 32,000 databases. The first one is by collection. That just means the type of record. So I've actually copied that screen right over here. Um, and let me just read through those so that you know what we're talking about. I can say, show me all census and voter lists or all birth, marriage and death records, military, immigration and travel, newspaper and publications, pictures, stories, memories, and histories, maps, atlases, and gazetteers, schools, directories, and church histories, tax, criminal, land, and wills, reference dictionaries and almanacs, or almanacs, <laughs> it's a funny word, or family trees, okay? So those are my collection level filters. Now, one of the things that I can point out here that I feel like I need to point out here when you're doing those global searches for specific people in your family tree, 
there are some of these record types that will never come up. For example, maps, atlases, and gazetteers are not typically indexed by a person's name. They're typically indexed by a location. So if all you've ever done on Ancestry.com is search for people, you are missing out on this huge collection, and, and it doesn't sound huge when you look at some of these other numbers, but we have 184 databases that are just maps, atlases, and gazetteers. Now, sure, you can go to Google Maps and you can try to Google a location, but what if that location doesn't exist anymore? We have online a database that has an 1854 gazetteer. And so if a place like where my grandfather was born no longer exists, my grandfather was born in 1920, and then several years after he was born, uh, the state dammed up a river, and the town that my grandfather was born in is now at the bottom of a lake, <laughs> right? And so that place no longer exists. So I have to look at old maps in order to figure out where that location was. So I could come in here to Maps, Atlases, and Gazetteers. Let me come over here, scroll down, click on Maps, Atlases, and Gazetteers. And now what I'm looking at is a list of 184 databases that contain maps for specific time periods or locations. So I could um, filter further or I can just look through this list and see if one of these things were help, would help me locate where it is that my grandfather was born. Okay, so again, that's not ever going to come up if I pull up this database when you do a name search because look at this screen, right? My search box here for this specific database has nowhere to put a name. All we're searching is locations. And so I would use the keyword field to fill in whatever locations or I would use this browse box over here. I'm interested, say, for example, in an 1891 map. Um, here's a map, um, an atlas for, to accompany the official records of the Union and Confederate Armies. That's volumes one and two, right, published in 1891. Uh, I could just scroll through these and just see what other types of atlases or maps exist for different time periods. Again, just a reminder, that's never going to come up in a name search. You're only going to be able to get to this database through the card catalog, and then you can search this database based on what information is included. So lots of really rich resources like that that you can discover. Um, maps, atlases, and gazetteers are just one of them. Pictures is another one. Um, we have pictures of locations. We actually have a very extensive postcard collection, and they're postcards of towns and villages and landmarks throughout time. Uh, some of them are photographs, obviously, and some of them are paintings or drawings. And you're not going to find those because they usually aren't based on a person's name, they're based on a location. So explore the collections using the filters here um, to see what exists. Now the second type of filter you have available to you is a location filter. So let's say for example that you are currently a US subscriber to Ancestry.com and you're interested in upgrading to the world subscription of Ancestry.com and your family is from Germany. Well, one of the first things you should do before you subscribe or upgrade to that world subscription is come into the card catalog and see if Ancestry.com even has records for Germany. So I can come in here. The location filter is below the collection filter. I can click on Europe, and then it's going to give me a list of countries in Europe, and so I can come down here and click on Germany. And now I have just taken my list of 32,000 databases and narrowed it down to 1,700. So Ancestry.com has 1,700 databases that contain records for Germany. Now if I happen to know where in Germany my family's from, which you really should before you start doing research in German records, there aren't very, there are actually no countrywide records for Germany because Germany wasn't a country until recently in history. Um, it was a collection of kingdoms and boundaries shifted constantly over the course of the last couple thousand years. And so you might need to know uh, more specifically where in Germany your family was from. And so you can look at this further list of locations. So let's say that my family's from Rhineland. I can click on Rhineland and now I'm looking at a list of uh, 238 databases that contain records 
for people from Rhineland or where locations in Rhineland are mentioned in that database. Okay, and then again, I can then combine filters. So maybe I'm interested in, um, you know, birth, marriage, and death records from that area, or maybe I'm interested in census records from that area or military records from that area. I could then see what a more specific list based on those filters. Now, there's this little button here that I keep clicking and I just wanna make sure that I point it out. It's this reset all filters and start over button. So as you use these filters, you can either just uncheck them one at a time and you'll notice my database list grows and grows, right? Or I can just reset all filters and it takes me back to my original list of 31,389 databases. The final major filter that we have on the card catalog is a time-based filter. So again, if you're interested in knowing if Ancestry.com has records for Virginia in the 1700s, you can filter by a location and then by either a century or a decade. So I'm gonna click on birth, marriage, and death records here. I'm specifically interested in birth records. I'm interested in birth records for the US and I can scroll down to Virginia. And then uh, the filter just below that is going to be filter by date. So I can say I wanna see all birth records for Virginia for the 1700s. And then I see here my list of 653 databases. I can also filter more specifically by decade if that's more useful, just to see what records exist for the 1740s in Virginia, and I get a more specific list of databases. Now keep in mind, um, these filters are kind of loose, and here's what I mean by that. Ancestry.com recognizes that not, not all records are specifically categorized. So for example, I may have a, for example, this Mayflower Births and Deaths. This is a collection, this is actually a um, publication done by a gentleman who worked with the Mayflower Society documenting seven or eight generations of the descendants of the 102 passengers on the Mayflower. Was it 102? I think so. Um, and he collected information to document their births and deaths for those descendants. So it's not what we would call an original record, right? He has copied information that he was able to find from other sources and put it into these books. But if your ancestor was born in Virginia, as many of these descendants ended up being, if your ancestor was born in Virginia in the 1740s, and this may be the only record that exists of their birth, because some of the original source material that the, this gentleman used may no longer be in existence. It may have been destroyed or it may have fallen to the ravages of time or it may have been a family Bible that is that has been lost that nobody knows who owns it or where it's in the possession, you know, who it's in the possession of. So sometimes, you know, you can't find an actual birth certificate. Those are actually a fairly new thing, um, but you still can find birth information. And so we categorize this as a birth type of record because there is birth information in it. I hope that makes sense. That's really important. So let me just um, walk you through. We've got a few minutes. I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples, and then I'll share my big favorite fun hint. So uh, I have, this is the example that I always use. If you've heard me speak, you've probably heard this before, but it, this example can be used and applied to whatever your situation is. So I have some great grandparents, great, whatever, great, great, um, who were born in about 1860, or who were married in about 1863. Now these great grandparents were born and died in Carroll County, Arkansas, which is in the northwest corner of Arkansas. Um, their, their parents lived there, their siblings lived there, their children lived there. As a matter of fact, my grandparents lived there um, until they came out to California during um, World War II. 
So really strong, rich heritage of my family in that northwest corner of Arkansas. I think my grandparents, these grandparents were married in about 1863 because their oldest child was born in 1864. So I kind of have this window of time where I'm looking for a marriage record for this couple. So I'm going to come in here into the title field and I'm just going to type in the word Arkansas. I could use the location filters, but sometimes it's faster just to type the name of the state into the title field. As you can see, I've just now narrowed my list to 56 databases very just with that one thing. Now, I'm looking specifically for a marriage record. So I'm going to click on birth, marriage, and death as my filter. And then I'm going to click on marriage to filter it even further. Okay. And then I could click on time period if I wanted to filter it even further. My great grandparents, we think we're married in about 1863. And so now what I'm looking at is a database is a collection of five databases that contain marriage records for that time period. Okay, and so then I can go through these databases one at a time and search for my great grandparents. Now, here's the thing when you go to a database, I'm going to right click that and open it in a new link so I don't lose this list. I'm a big fan of that. If you've never seen me do that, you just right click on a link and open link in new tab. And it opens it in a new tab so you can come over here and do what you need to do. And then when you close it, you're right back to your original list, which maintains it. You don't have to keep redoing it or go back, 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 right? Okay, so I'm going to right click this and open it in a new tab. Before you start searching, and I know it's tempting to fill in those pretty empty boxes, scroll down past the, the search box and on every single database on Ancestry.com we have a database description. That database description includes source information of where this information was obtained from. In this case it's a private, uh, an individual uh, who went through some courthouse records, extracted records from microfilm or books, and then if you scroll down past that, you're going to see um, further information. In this case, what, what you're gonna see here is a list of which counties are included and the year range for the coverage of those counties. So this database is called Arkansas Marriages from 1820 to 1949. But you'll notice not every county in Arkansas is included in this particular database. And as a matter of fact, Carroll County, which is the county that I'm interested in, isn't included at all. That is useful information to me because if I had just jumped into searching, I might have gotten very frustrated searching and searching and searching and not finding my ancestor's record. But if I had just read the database description, I can see Carroll County is not included, so I'm not interested in that database. Let's go check one of these other databases, right? So you just work your way through the databases, checking those database descriptions. Now here, this particular database, Carroll County is included. Carroll County was formed in 1833. Good, that's good information. However, the records in this database cover the years 1869 through 1900. So the county records from which this particular um, database was created, those marriage records don't start until 1869. And remember, I'm looking for a marriage record from 1863. So again, I've saved myself some headache. However, uh, I, there's a couple of things about family history that I know, and one of them is that uh, it's really useful to know more about family members because um, that information about family members can often lead you to more information about the people you're looking for. Not only that, it tells the whole story, right? Um, no person uh, is, lives their life in isolation. They live their life with parents and siblings and nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles and cousins. And, um, and so the more you learn about those people, the more you're learning about your ancestors. So I'm going to do a search here. I've put in the last name of the family that is from that location. In the marriage location field, I have put Carroll County, Arkansas, and I'm actually going to mark that exact because I only want to see results from Carroll County for right now. I didn't mark the surname exact because I've seen it misspelled dozens of ways, right? And so I'm going to click search and I'm going to get 16 search results. 16 search results. Now think about if I had done that on a global search it's very likely I would have ended up with a lot more than that. So searching specific databases that you find through the card catalog actually allows you to focus more specifically on a location 
and on a particular surname with some success. Now I've done this, I've done my homework, so I happen to know that I'm related to all 16 of these couples on this page. Um, and of course the joke is that I'm related to some of them in more than one way because it is Northwest Arkansas. But um, there are a couple of records on this page that I likely would have never found doing a traditional search. And here's why. In my family history, um, collected by my mom um, as she met with some of these people and their descendants over the years. Uh, I had a notation that um, Uncle Jack Lawrence was married to Aunt Matt, okay? And that's all I knew. I knew their kids. I knew about when they would have been married. I had some information like that, but nothing more specific. Um, and it turns out that uh, Uncle Jack's actual name was Andrew Jackson Lawrence, and Aunt Matt's name was Martha Francis Bradley. I was able to um, use this because I knew about when they were married to determine that the, this is actually their marriage record. If I had done a search for a Jack Lawrence married to a Matt, even if I had figured out that Matt stood for Martha, was a nickname for Martha, this record likely would have not come up or would have come up so far down in my search results, I might not have noticed it. But because I did a search in this specific database for this specific location, I was then able to go through each, you know, each one of these 16 records and match it up to a member of my family. So that's really um, some really powerful ways you can do searching and ways in which the card catalog aids in that searching. Okay, so let me just wrap up with a couple of things in my big hint of the day. Okay, first is just don't be afraid to explore. I know I said that before when we were talking about the Learning Center on Tuesday, but the, it's the truth. Like, just go and play with the card catalog and see what you can discover. Also, scroll down past that search box. Be sure to read those database descriptions before you start searching. A little quick tip, if you find a database you're interested in, bookmark it with your web browser to, re to refer to it later. Like if, for example, um, I have a few databases and actually rather than bookmarking them, what I've done is I've actually quick linked them. So on your home page, you should have a little quick links widget. Here's mine over here on the right hand side. If you don't, you can customize your homepage and find it. But what I've done is I've actually added the US Public Records Index and the 1940 census and the US city directories. Here's that Arkansas marriages database, right? I've quick linked some of those databases so that I can jump right to them from my homepage because I know I'm gonna be doing a lot of work or a lot of research in those databases. Okay, now here's the big hint of the day. Whenever you're on a database, if you look up here at the URL, it's typically going to say search.ancestry.com slash search. Um, there's going to be some computer lingo here. Then there's going to be this acronym DBID, which stands for database identification. DBID equals, and then typically a four digit number. If you find a database that you are really interested in or that you think your family is gonna be in, take note of that four digit number. Okay, so this is the one for Arkansas, 2548. Um, here's the one for the 1880 census, 6742, right? And then when you are viewing your hints on ancestry.com, so here's my hints page. Um, I've clicked on record. I can actually add a little bit of information to the end of my URL here. When I'm viewing records, it's just going to um, look like this. It's just gonna say trees, and then it's gonna have my unique tree number, and then it's gonna say hints, and it's gonna say record, because I clicked on this record button, right? But then I can add, and I'll show you on a, on a PowerPoint here in just a minute, I can add and HDBID equals and that four digit ID number from that database. And now what I'm looking at here are only hints from the 1880 census, or only hints from the 1940 census, or only hints from the social security death index, or the Washington marriages index, or the, right? Whatever database you want, just look at those last four digits, add it on to the end of your search or your hints URL, and you can then view data, um, you can then view hints for only that specific database. So here's what you're gonna put on when you're viewing hints, and, when you're viewing your hints, and you've clicked on record hints, you're going to add 
this little piece of information here, and HDBID equals, and then that little four digit code from the end of the database URL. You add that to the end of your hints URL and hit enter, and then it will show you only hints from that specific database. Hopefully that was worth the wait. For those of you who know how to use the card catalog, um, this little tip or this little hint, oftentimes I just want to I just want to go through and like I use the Social Security Death Index one a lot. I just want to view just my hints from the Social Security Death Index so that I can go through and see if anybody's passed away um, in my tree that I haven't collected that death information for yet. Uh, that works really well. When the 1940 census came out, I viewed just hints from the 1940 census. Um, and anytime I add a new family, maybe I just want to add just hints from the 1920 census to the 1930 census. So one more time, you, when you're viewing your hints, click on record hints and then add and HDBID equals and then the four digit database ID from the database and hit enter. Uh, to the, add that to the end of the URL and hit enter, and then it'll allow you to view hints by just that specific database. So that's the card catalog and some tips and tricks for how I use the card catalog to do my research faster, smarter, better, and to sometimes find things that I might not have found any other way um, because that global search searches all 12 billion records on Ancestry.com. Um, I'm going to be uh, uploading this video to YouTube in just a little while. I'm also going to do a blog post with some of this information today. So if you uh, didn't catch that URL information, I will add that to the blog um, a little bit later today so you can access that there as well. That is all we have time for today. I hope this was useful information for you. If you have any questions and are watching this live, I will be on chat in just a few minutes. If you're watching an archived version of this on our YouTube channel, feel free to leave a comment. I do monitor those and will respond as necessary. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.